Take your Bibles and turn to John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 3. And uh, as you turn there, I want to bring to you a message that basically deals with the assurance of salvation. You know, a lot of times in life, you ask somebody about their salvation, and you'll say, well, are you saved? Do you know that you know if something were to happen to you today that heaven would be your home? And you'll hear this many times. Well, I hope so. I hope so. And, uh, you know, I try not to be very critical of uh, people who make that statement to me, especially if they're a lot older than I am, uh, because uh, they come up in a time whenever hope was, uh, the basic word hope had a different meaning. Uh, how many of you remember folks using the word hope for help? Anybody? Uh, my granddaddy used to say whenever he was getting ready to crop uh, uh, the crops that he was growing, he said, I got to go find me some hope. And of course, I was a young fella, and I said, Granddaddy, don't you mean help? He said, Well, that, that's the same difference. But, uh, but anyway, uh, I want to talk to you about the assurance of your salvation. I want to bring to you a message that I've titled, How Can I Be Sure That I Am Saved? How Can I Be Sure? that I am saved. Notice, if you will, John's Gospel, chapter 3, uh, a portion of verse 3. I want to start where Jesus is speaking in the red. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and now, God, as we try to learn from the things that you'll teach us today from your precious word. Use it for your glory that we may see Jesus. And we'll be careful to give you thanks for all you do in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. One of the greatest scriptures that you'll find penned in God's precious word is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 12. And I'm going to share that scripture with you, and I hope that as you hear the wording of this scripture, that it may speak to your heart as you think about the assurance of your salvation. Someone has asked the question, how can I know, preacher, that I'm saved? Well, I think that Paul gives us a prime example of knowing in this particular verse of scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul said, For I know in whom I have believed. He didn't say, I think I know in whom I believe. He said, I know, I know in whom I have believed. And then listen to what he said. He said, And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Against what day? Against the day of death. Against the day of dying. I know that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him. Friend, the Lord God committed unto us his only begotten son to die on the cross of Calvary. And when the Spirit of God began to draw you by faith to himself and you were saved by the grace of God... He instilled into you that you too can be persuaded that God is able to keep that which uh, he's, that you've committed unto him. And if you've committed yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, my friend, then you are saved by the grace of God. But I want us to be very careful whenever I use that statement. Because today thousands of nominal, what we'll call nominal Christians, show no signs whatsoever of being born again. Uh, they show no signs of what the scripture teaches us of, about being born again. Now you know, God, God help me not to be judgmental in what I'm about to preach to you. Because God knows that I am not anyone's judge. God is our judge. But the Bible does teach me that we can inspect fruit. We can be a fruit inspector. Now, whenever I use that term, 
Jesus said, by their fruits, you shall know them. And so whenever I begin to preach a message like this, and I mention nominal Christians, that you can't tell them from the world. We're living in sad times. I want to give you several things that God has shown me, basically from the first epistle of John. I wanted to use this scripture where Jesus said you must be born again as a text, but we'll be going to several other places in the scripture as I bring to you the message that God has shown to me. Now, I want to give to you uh, four or either five things uh, that can basically let you know where you stand with God, let you know whether you're saved or not. First of all, you're saved if there is no habitual sinning in your life. You're saved if there is no habitual sinning in your life. When I preach, you've got to be careful whenever you say that to me because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, that's very true. We all have sinned and we've come short of the glory of God. But you need to understand that when you were saved by the grace of God, that God did a work in you. And he took away some of those things that you used to love to be involved in. And you're not involved in those things anymore. And so when you're saved by the grace of God, then you're not a habitual sinner. Now that word habitual comes from a word that means having a constant habit to do so. You just continue to do the things that you know that's not pleasing in the sight of God. Listen to the words that John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, verse number 9. John said this, he said, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And again in 1 John 5, 18, he said this, he said, Whosoever is born of God sinneth not. He sinneth not. So a person who has been born again by the power of God, a person who has been regenerated by Almighty God does not habitually commit sin. He no longer sins with his heart and his whole inclination of living has been changed completely. I've never ever done anything wrong after being saved by the grace of God, that the Spirit of God did not convict me of it. I've never, ever done anything wrong after being saved by the grace of God that the Spirit of God did not convict me of it. Now, John also said, My little children, I would that you sin not. And that's what what God would have for us to do is not to sin. But he went on to say, but if you do, that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I'm not trying to tell you that once you're saved by the grace of God, that you're going to be a perfect person. God forbid, because there's only been one perfect person and we hung him suspended between heaven and earth to die for our sins. He was a perfect person. When you get saved, it doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect in all that you do, but it does mean that you're going to begin to strive to be perfect. You're going to begin to strive to be perfect, and you're not going to habitually sin. God help us today as children of God not to fall into habitual sin, because if we do, then we might need to examine our salvation experience. Number two, you know that you're saved because you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that word believe comes from a word that simply means to have confidence in or to trust in completely the existence of the reliability. Boy, my speech impediment like to got me then. The reliability of of someone, uh, relying on someone, believing 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, 1 John 5, 1, listen to what John wrote here. He said, Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So a man or a woman who is born again or regenerated believes that Jesus Christ is the only Savior who can pardon his soul and that he is the divine person appointed by God the Father for this very purpose. And beside Jesus Christ, there is no other Savior. Now, don't misunderstand me whenever I say this because uh, our world today wants us to be tolerant of everything. Did you hear me? Our world today wants us to be tolerant of everything. We've had other religions and, and other movements to move into to even our land today and we're told that we need to be tolerant. Now, you've got to be careful with that word tolerance. Don't misunderstand me. I would never do anything to hurt anybody's feelings. I love everybody, even everybody that's a little bit different than I am, as my wife taught well this morning. I, I love everybody, and everybody, even those who may be a little bit different than I am. But let me tell you something. I will never say, as long as I live, that there's more doors to get into heaven than Jesus. Jesus said, I am the door. And by me, if men enter in, he'll go in and out and find pasture. Bless God, you can't find pasture outside of Jesus. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. So you know that you're saved if you believe that Jesus is the Christ and that he is the only door to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And those who come by me, they're going to find that pasture. They're going to find that life. There's no other way. Jesus is the way. So if you don't have habitual sin, and if you believe that Jesus is the only way and you've trusted him, and believe that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, then you're saved. Number three, how can I know, preacher, that I'm saved? Well, you know that you're saved, thirdly, by practicing righteousness. Now, listen to me. That word, practice, is a good word. Have you ever heard the terminology, practice makes perfect? Anybody ever heard that? I think that we all have. Uh, my oldest son is a uh, baseball coach. And he practices with his team. But it hadn't made them perfect yet. <laughs> but he practices with his team every day. Especially the days before they have a game. He practices with them. You see, one of the things that you and I need to do is realize that we need to practice righteousness. What does that word practice mean? It means to carry out or to perform righteousness. Listen to what John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. John said, Everyone that doeth right is born of him. Everyone that doeth right is born of him. So the man that is born again, the man that is regenerated, the woman that is born again, the woman that is regenerated, you're either a holy man or a holy woman. Now, I know some of you probably say, well, there's nothing holy about me. Well, if you've got Jesus in your heart, there's a bunch holy, me, holy, holy about you. Amen? Amen? Christ in you is holy. Christ is holy. You see, a holy man or woman endeavors to love according to God's will. How did God love? He loved with an unconditional love. He loves you in spite of yourself. He loves you if you look good. He loves you. He loves you if you're ugly. He loves you. He loves you if you're rich. He loves you. 
He loves you if you're poor. He loves you. He loves you if your bricks are one shy of a full load. He loves you. He loves you in spite of yourself. That's the kind of love that our God has for all people. I know some of you laughing about that one brick statement. He loves me. Amen. Hey, I mean, you know, I'm glad that he loves me. He endeavors to love. A, a, a man of God who's been saved by the grace of God endeavors to love according to God's will to do the things that please God and to avoid the things that God hates. You mean God hates? Well, go to the book of Proverbs. He'll give you a list of the things that he hates. Okay? And you'll find out what those are. But God wants us to love. Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And then he said, Ye are my friends. And he laid down his life and died for us. We ought to love one another so much that we would be willing to die for one another. Jesus loved us that much. That is unconditional. I think the word for it is agape love. That means I'm going to love you in spite of yourself. Amen? You know that you're saved when you are practicing that kind of righteousness. That you love the brethren. Now, that goes right into the, the, the next point. Number four, you know that you're saved if you love other Christians. Now, that doesn't say you know that you're saved if you love other Christians, if they agree with everything that you want to do. You see, there's a lot of times that, that uh, we may not be on the same page. Somebody might be on a different page. Somebody else may have a different theory or a different idea. Uh, today I decided to wear green. I know it's not St. Patrick's Day, but I like green every now and then. And somebody else may say, why is our preacher wearing green today? He'd look better in blue. Well, that's all right. I like green, okay? I mean... We all are not going to like the same thing. Uh, we're not. And, and most of the time, before we leave the house, <laughs> I'll walk in and I'll say, Honey, does this look all right? I didn't do that this morning because I was scared of what she would say. <laughs> but I, I, uh, I, usually I'll walk in and I'll say, Honey, does this look all right? And if I hear this, I'm not saying nothing. I know that I need to go change. <clears throat> I know that I need to go change. You see, because she didn't like it. She, she didn't like it. Uh, and, you know, I used to like snake skin cowboy boots. I really did. She don't like them. So I don't wear them no more, <laughs> all right? But, I mean, listen, we all don't like the same thing. But listen to me. We got to love each other in spite of our differences. Again, you did very well this morning to go along with what I'm preaching in the children's sermon. Seeing others through the Lord's eyes. Seeing ourselves through the Lord's eyes. You see, whenever I begin to think about that word loving there, that word loving comes from a, a word that talks about being affectionate. God wants us to be affectionate toward other Christians. God wants us to be fond of other Christians. God wants us to be devoted to other Christians. God wants us to have feelings of, that causes us to demonstrate the love of Christ to other Christians. Well, preacher, how did he demonstrate that? God demonstrated his own love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God wants us to demonstrate our love for one another. I mean, He does. Listen to what 1 John 3.14 says. John wrote this. He said, we know that we have passed from death unto life, listen, because we love 
the brethren. You see, you know that you're saved if you love your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know that you're saved if you do that. And then last of all, fifthly, you know that you're saved if you're overcoming the world. You know that you're saved if you're overcoming the world. Now that word overcoming comes from a word that basically means to succeed in dealing with. We all have to deal with the world. We don't have to love where our world is and what our world is doing and the things that may be going on our or on in our world, but we still have to overcome those things that are going on in our world. Succeeding in dealing with our world, we have to master our world instead of allowing our world to master us. You see, the biggest problem with many today is they're allowing their world to master them instead of them mastering their world. You've got to reach a place in your life as a child of God that you're going to conquer your world. You've got to reach a place in your life that you're going to defeat your world. Now listen to me. Don't think you can do it by yourself because you can't. That's why you need to know that you're saved by the grace of God so that you can overcome the world. Listen to what John wrote in 1 John 5, verse 4. John wrote, Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. Whosoever born, is born of God overcometh the world. Now listen to me, church. The world's going to throw some stuff out at you from time to time. It really is. I know a lot of you may have trouble riding by those lottery signs whenever it says 457 million. You see, whenever you pass that by and say, I'm not going to spend my money and waste my money on such, you're overcoming the world. You're overcoming the world. Whenever you can lay anything aside for the glory of God, you're overcoming the world. I'm still trying to lay some of the table aside. I'm trying to overcome the world. I am. I'm trying. God's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. But I'm doing my best to try to overcome. God wants us to overcome the world. Listen, a man or a woman who is born again will not use the world's opinions in his standard of right and wrong. Did you hear that? We're living in a day whenever we try to say everything that's wrong is right now and everything that's right is wrong. Did you get that? That's where we are. We can't let the world dictate to us what's right and wrong. You want to know what's right and wrong? Pick up your Bible. It'll tell you what's right and what's wrong. So, so we we got to be careful. We don't need to let the world's opinions and standards uh, dictate right and wrong to us. We don't mind going against the world's ways. You know, I get accused of that quite regularly. Well, you know, preacher, times has changed. But God hasn't. God hasn't changed. The Word of God hasn't changed. Oh, I realize there's liberal people out there trying to write their own Bible, but that don't, that don't thrill me any. It's not going to change my opinion and my theories and my thoughts and ideas of what God's true Word says. It's not. Listen, we've got to be careful. We don't need to mind standing against the world's ways, the world's ideas, the world's customs. You see, the man or woman who loves God gives God more praise than he gives man. Did you hear me? And when we give God more praise than we give man, then we're overcoming the world. Now listen as we bring this thing to a head and close it up. My friend, you've given your life to the Lord. That's wonderful. Do you have that assurance? Do you really have that assurance? I've given you five things this morning. Five things. And those five things, as you examine yourself through the eyes of Christ, 
should tell you where you are with Christ. Now I want you to know this. I am not trying to get anybody to make a profession of faith this morning. But I do want you to examine your heart and examine your lives with these five things that I've given to you. And then you choose where you are with the Lord. Do you have the assurance that if you were to die right now that you'd go straight to heaven? If you don't have that assurance, I'm here to tell you that you can have that assurance. Well, preacher, how can I have that assurance? Several ways. Number one, admit that you're a sinner. First, you must understand what the Bible says about you. The Bible says, for all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. Number two, how can I know? You've got to abandon your self effort. You see, I've had a lot of people to tell me along life's way, well, preacher, whenever I can get just a little bit better, I'll get right. Well, honey, you won't ever get saved if you depend on your getting better because you can't get better. The Lord will take you just like you are. Dirty, filthy sins and all, He'll take you just like you are. Now, he he probably won't leave you there. When you get saved, he won't leave you where you are. He's going to make a change in you. But you see, you've got to abandon yourself. That's where the problem comes in. Most of us just don't want to abandon who we are. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than the riches this world has to offer. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Why? Because he that lays his treasures up in heaven is rich indeed. What I need to do? Well, you need to acknowledge the payment. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And when you acknowledge the payment that Jesus paid it all, then all you've got to do is open your heart and accept him as Savior of your life. Not only as Savior, but then you've got to make Him Lord. And when you make Him Lord, you can begin to sing. I heard an old, old story. O victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood. Very simple. Those are the only things that you'll need to do. To be saved by the grace of God and to know that you're saved. Stand with me. Father, I've shared with your people that that you've given me. Use it now for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.